welcome wherever you're joining us from, whether it be across the UK and Ireland, as far afield as Tenerife or around the world. Extra time for those who haven't uh, seen one as yet. It's a chance to hear an interview, watch an interview with a high profile individual who's perhaps achieved quite a lot in sport. And we're very lucky today to have a guest who has certainly done that, particularly over the past few years making big waves at Liverpool Football Club. Before we introduce him, uh, just a quick word if you would like to ask a question. Of course, you should know how to use the text bar on the side. Those questions should drop in automatically and I will try and get through as many as possible. It's a perfect way to end your week. We've got a, a brilliant guest with us today, uh, live from America, Santa Barbara to be exact, but Merseyside was his home as a young boy and indeed for the past few years as he was involved in the remarkable events that saw Liverpool win a Champions League and, of course, the Premier League after a 30-year wait. Peter Moore, the uh, former Liverpool Chief Executive. Welcome, Peter. Hey, Steve. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning here from Santa Barbara, California. My apologies for the sunshine. For those of you particularly on Merseyside, uh, the, the yellow ball in the sky is, um, is something I'm sure you haven't seen in a little while. But uh, I'm going to move around as the sun moves. But it's great to be able to chat with everybody here 8 a.m., here on a, a, a balmy uh, Friday morning here in uh, Southern California. Absolutely. I think it's a problem we, we'd all like to have. Look, you, you've only just made that switch, haven't you? And I alluded straight away to your connections to Merseyside and, and your love of Liverpool Football Club. We'll get onto your gaming background a little bit later on, but let's kick off straight away with that remarkable moment in your life where you were asked by the Fenway Sports Group to come on board at Liverpool. What did it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those, and, and, and as people's careers progress, you will um, encounter people call headhunters. They're not as aggressive as they sound. They're executive recruiters that are trying to lure you into a different career. They are um, contracted by employers to go find the best and the brightest for, for a role, usually a, a, a relatively high-profile role, because it isn't cheap. Um, but I got a call, um, gosh, this would be in the summer of 2016, and uh, executive recruiters kind of dance around the situation because they want to get a feel for your interest before they get into some details. But once I realized that the role was chief executive officer of Liverpool Football Club, obviously that piqued my interest. Um, I had um, actually got to know John Henry and, and uh, Tom Werner and Mike Gordon prior to this in, in being this kind of strange dude born in Liverpool, uh, lived in Boston working for Reebok, um, big fan of the Boston Red Sox, obviously a huge Liverpool fan, but also somebody uh, primarily in my video game career that had come to the fore as regards leading large organizations through um, a lot of turmoil and disruption. And certainly video games over the last 10 years have experienced plenty of that. So for somebody that, you know, my dad took me to Anfield in 1959. We went to see Liverpool beat Leighton Orient 4-3 in November of that year. Bill Shankly was still yet to arrive at the club and um, I can still remember those days and I kind of progressed from the boys pen to the paddock to the cop and then eventually you know more recently to the boardroom so it's been a great journey for me you know my dad uh, I owe a lot to for imbuing a, a love of this incredible football club that we have as well as understanding what the football club means to the city of Liverpool and as I learned when I joined the club the hundreds of millions of fans around the world um, who bluntly live and die by each result. And uh, obviously, nervous weekend coming up with a big game against uh, our friends from up the M62 on, on Sunday. So, yeah, it was a phenomenal moment, Steve. Absolutely. Now, from what you've said there, it, it was clear that you had that emotional connection as um, a young guy growing up. But once you take a role within the football club, and particularly that role, do you understand far more about the size and the dynamic of Liverpool Football Club globally? Yeah, having come out of Silicon Valley, where I worked for the past 20 years, data was important. People could say, big football club, I need to know numbers behind that. So we, we actually uh, commissioned Nielsen to get a feel for what the size and magnitude of our fan base was. We, you know, we, we knew that we believed, and I still believe, we are the biggest football club in the world by a number of metrics. Nielsen calculated, um, and I challenged this, 771 million people around the world follow Liverpool Football Club. Now, anything on, on the continuum of follow from, yeah, I'll look at their score first, to I fly over from Bangkok every other weekend to Anfield <laughs> to watch the game and every step in between. 
I truly believe having gone through the numbers and, and then arrived at a number that I felt comfortable talking about publicly, that there are about 400 million people who would put their hand up and say, I'm a Liverpool fan. Um, and so the real challenge when I arrived, and you remember these days, Steve, is that, that you know, the local fans, you know, scousers believe that they have this birthright to be able to get a ticket to Anfield to, if they want to, be on the car. Um, and in the days when I used to go, yeah, you rolled up and it was 50p, push through the turnstiles and you go fight for a place on the, on the cop, having progressed from the boys' pen. But I also could recognize that there was some friction and tension, which you have with a global entity where we rely so much on that local passion um, and the atmosphere at Anfield, which is unique, having been to most of the major football stadiums in the world now, world now. throughout my life, you know, from that perspective, um, and I coined this phrase, local heart, but with a global pulse. And that was both descriptive of Liverpool Football Club, but also gave us a business platform by which to be able to address some of the challenges and figure out where we were going to deploy our resources to tread this fine line to make sure that we understood that Anfield and you'll never walk alone and the Shankly era and, and Kenny Dalglish and Ian Rush, and more recently, obviously, um, coming into an era with Jurgen Klopp coming in, you have to meld all of that together. You trade on that. You actually build that as your platform by which you trade on that. And, and by that, I mean the imagery of those days, the unique history. Um, you build marketing platforms like This Means More, which I think is indicative of what it means, certainly what we saw in winning the Premier League for Liverpool fans. Um, you know, it sounds pretentious and a little pious, but it does mean more for a Liverpool fan maybe than it does for other football fans because of the unique nature of the relationship between the people of Liverpool, the people around the world who support the club, the city itself and the football club. Um, and so, you know, from that perspective, um, you, I really got to figure out both from a, a metrics perspective as well as from an emotional passion perspective, what Liverpool means for fans around the world. You had an incredible few years, Peter, with the football club. Now, this doesn't just happen by chance, and you sort of alluded to it there. Everything has to fit into place. That might be from having a great chief executive. It might be from a, having a manager like Jurgen Klopp. And it's interesting that, that you know and you reference Bill Shankly, and it's often said that he is the closest thing to Bill Shankly. You, you've seen him at close quarters. How, how big... Has it been for Liverpool to have Jurgen Klopp and that relationship? Yeah, I mean, Shankly, of course, famous quote, which, you know, you know, I was made for Liverpool and Liverpool was made for me. Or, you know, from, from that perspective, you could say absolutely the same about Jurgen Klopp. You know, Shankly from Glen Buck in Ayrshire in Scotland, not a scouser, not even English, but understood what football meant for the people of Liverpool. Jurgen Klopp coming from Mainz uh, to Dortmund, you know, working class environments uh, and then coming to Liverpool, fully understanding what Liverpool Football Club means to the people, the red half of Liverpool. Um, and equally importantly, for the people all around the world who, when you talk to them, as I did, as I traveled the world and, and did things like this, or, or, or more likely spent my evening in a bar at the official Liverpool Supporters Club in some dive bar in Dubai or Bangkok or Barcelona, as I've done, um, and talk for hours about the football club and made presentations and made those fans a little bit, try to feel a little bit closer, even though they were geographically thousands of miles away, make them feel closer about the football club. So yeah, the uniqueness of what Liverpool is, you can go Shankly, you can go Paisley, you go all the way through, uh, you know, the, the uh, recently uh, tragically late departed Gerard Houllier, Rafa Benitez, mm. all the way through. And I don't want to miss anybody out, but you know, those are the, core guys, Joe Fagan, and obviously uh, more recently you get into, um, uh, into Brendan Rodgers and now Jurgen Klopp, who for many people is the best manager in the world right now, and certainly by far the most charismatic and one that can speak eloquently about football, but knowing him as well as I do can equally speak as eloquently about life in general. And I think that's a rarity in football managers who tend to be just very myopic about football itself. You would you spent a lot of time, Steve, with Jürgen. You know that he's a very worldly, broad-thinking human being. And I think the people of Liverpool appreciate that because we're kind of a global city uh, by the nature of our history of seafaring. So we appreciate somebody that sees past just the boundaries of the city of Liverpool. And, and Jürgen certainly does. And 
and being a, a somewhat socialist left leaning individual as well helps in the city of Liverpool, as, as you well know. I think one of the great examples he sets, Jurgen Klopp, and perhaps an, it's an important lesson for people watching today who want to forge a, a career in sport is the way that he understands the club, but also the way he, he communicates around it as well. Yeah, I think that there, there is that understanding of the fans uh, that is important. You know, he does things that a lot of managers don't feel comfortable doing. He'll speak about issues outside of football and stick his neck on the line, as he's done um, since the day he arrived at Liverpool. Um, he is having spent a lot of time in his presence, either on team planes, um, you know, watching him in press conferences, dealing with commercial partners, and perhaps more importantly, um, how he manages players. He is an unbelievable manager of men. And by that, I say, you know, a, a football club with the assessed value of Liverpool now, just short maybe of a, of a billion pounds, um, has all kinds of characters. And you've interviewed most of them and interacted with most of them. Um, chemistry is critical. And there's so many football clubs around the world that have wonderful players, but somehow can't make it all gel together. What Jürgen does is he understands each individual player. Some players need a kick in the rear. Some players need an arm around them. Everybody needs a clop hug. We all need a clop hug. Um, but he somehow manages to knit together this incredible collective. And, and um, that is, I think, symptomatic of socialism, but also symptomatic of what a team spirit is. And, and I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, I mean, there is competitive to score goals and, and there's bonuses against a lot of things that players want, and you can see that. But, you know, somehow, somewhere, despite little flare-ups, you get the feeling of being around the players that everybody is pulling in the same direction. And it goes back to Bill Shankly. His idea of socialism is everybody working together for the same objective, and football's no different. And Jürgen understands that. Absolutely. If you've just joined us, uh, our special guest is Peter Moore, the former Liverpool Chief Executive, who's currently in the Santa Barbara sunshine. Don't, don't worry about moving around the sundial, Peter, if it, if it keeps you out of the sun rays. Uh, we're, we're quite happy to, to watch you, you move about. Um, I will try and mix in some questions from our audience at the same time as us having uh, a chat. So um, we could be going in any direction here. We'll start with um, Harley Burns, who said, uh, what would you say, Peter, is the proudest achievement of your life so far? Of my life? Yeah. Well, um, I like to think that um, my children have been successful as a result of maybe me being able to give them every opportunity to, um, to be successful, giving them the right education, encouraging them to uh, push boundaries. Um, they're all American. Uh, they were born here in the US. Um, they're all adults. They're all successful in their own right. I think, you know, when, when your time comes, you'll look back and you'll look at your children and business is great, but, but family is everything. And so when I think of my kids, all who are doing well, living in, depending on the day, New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, all with professional careers, um, you look back and, and, and I think the obligation of, of, of people is to improve upon what the previous generation gave you. And, and my dad was a working class dad, God bless him. My mom was a nurse at Alder Hay. My dad worked on the Liverpool docks. Um, great jobs, performing wonderful work at a working class level, but gave me the platform to uh, have some level of success. Um, you know, fortuitously, and I still don't know how, I passed the 11 plus, which gave me <laughs> a key to, um, to grammar school and to O levels and to A levels and to university. And it's those those moments in your life, and look, I'm out, in a few weeks, I'll be 66, so I'm talking 55 years ago, I can still see me sat at Grove Park Grammar School for Boys in Wrexham, filling in the 11 plus, thinking, I failed this, I have totally screwed this up. And in those days, and, and, and I don't think any of you old enough to remember it, there, there was this divergence of the 11 plus, you were either going to be on a path to get to university, or you better figure out what trade and what you know, what physical working profession you were going to be in. Um, so I think, I think that obligation is, you know, when, when you leave this earth, that you have left your generation, the next generation behind you in a better place than you had it yourself is key. And, and I'd like to think, you know, from a perspective, when I think of my kids, um, that they're certainly 
uh, in that situation. I, you know, they've had everything. They've been fortunate and they would recognize that. They've all had the opportunity to go to university and graduate some of the best universities in the United States. Um, and they're pursuing professional careers. And, and that would be what I'm most proud of. You feel blessed about that. Look, it's probably a good moment to, to mention the foundation that you set up in, in Liverpool, because that is also something that will be quite high up on your priority list, helping perhaps others or individuals who haven't had the opportunity that you've had. Yeah, I mean, when, when my wife and I, again, chasing the sun, when my oh. wife and I um, arrived in Liverpool um, yeah, back in April of 2017, we lived uh, for a few months in, in the city itself, in the West Tower, which is a big off, uh, kind of the tallest building in Liverpool there. And uh, that gave us the opportunity to walk around and explore. Uh, I hadn't lived in Liverpool. I'd left Liverpool in 1965. Uh, and so it had been close to 50 odd years since I had lived in Liverpool and 38 years since I'd lived in the UK. My wife's an American, never lived outside of the United States. And one of the things that was obvious, the renaissance of this magnificent city was clear. You walk on the waterfront, um, you know, all the way down to the Albert Dock, all the way down to Toxeth and walk back and what a magnificent jewel on the Mersey, as I called it, it was. But you didn't need to go far to see austerity, poverty, um, streets that hadn't changed since I was a lad, uh, that uh, particularly growing up as I did on Scotland Road. Um, and my dad having a pub on Dryden Street, which is right by the tunnel entrance. And it was very clear to me that I had an obligation of somebody that had benefited from being born in Liverpool. And I say that because being born a Scouser, you've got an advantage over anybody else in the world. You've got this sense of cockiness and self-confidence and big personality and and uh, you know a, a, an aura about you as a Liverpudlian uh, that we all need to leverage. And I was certainly able to leverage my scouseness, um, you know, during my tough times of coming here as an immigrant in the United States, which was not easy for the first few years. So, um, long story short, I, I've done well in life financially. Uh, I've been able to, in my video game career. Um, you know, do okay, make a few bob, as we say in England. And um, it's very clear to me that the people of Liverpool in these areas we walk through needed my money need more than I needed my money. Um, and I, I'll be just fine. So I funded uh, the Peter Moore Foundation, founded it there in the summer of 2017, um, funded it from here in the US and went about with my wife, um, figuring out how we could help these people from Alder Hay Hospital, which I felt I had an obligation to give back because my mum was a nurse there just after World War II, funded um, cancer treatment rooms there. Food banks became a big deal. It was horrific to me to learn how much food poverty there was, in, it, first of all, in Britain, but, but more so in Liverpool. And Stephen and everybody, I think, that lives in Liverpool is well aware of fans supporting food banks and the great work mm. that Ian Byrne, our MP, uh, and Dave Kelly uh, do reds and blues together. And, um, you know, the first uh, few games, they rolled up to um, Anfield collecting food from fans. What we, what we tried to do is make going to the game, you couldn't go to the game unless you stopped at Tesco on the way and, and grabbed a bag of food and dropped it off. And, and you're very familiar with this, Stephen. And, and their rickety old van, I said, boy, th th this thing's not going to make it back uh, to the food bank. So... Uh, I sat down with them. I bought them the, the big purple van that, that you now see that's ubiquitous at Anfield and Goodison Park so that they could be more efficient in collecting food um, to be able to help these people who cannot put food on the table right now. And COVID has, has exacerbated that. So I think the ability for me to give back to, to the people and the city that gave me so much and such a great start in life, if you will, as regards the power of scouseness, which is actually a TED talk I did about a year ago at TED Liverpool, um, I, you know, is something that you you reflect upon. And I, before we, we went live here, we were talking about you get to the point in life where it's about giving back, not about taking anymore. And uh, I've certainly yeah, a while back um, passed that moment in my life. And a lot of it is doing things like this, trying to impart any pearls of wisdom that I might have, but equally importantly, helping those that help me. And um, I'm in a position, I'm fortunate that I'm in a position to do so.
Yeah, and you you certainly are right. Let, let's get to a few of these uh, these questions. I'll um I'll jumble a few together. This is from Kai McDowell who says, "How has it felt seeing the rise of Liverpool over the past few seasons from perhaps uh, being in the shadow of other clubs?" And above that, and I've actually lost the question. It was a question about perhaps what what are the tougher aspects of being in the job. And I, I've linked the two together because I think. There is this element of expectation, isn't there, when you run Liverpool Football Club? And there was a, a demand on yourself at the top of the hierarchy or the manager to actually bring silverware, to, to bring Liverpool back to the, the top, if you like. Yeah. Now, I, if you're old enough, you remember the glory years of the 70s and the 80s where we won everything. I mean, of course we won. And in fact, you know, you were disappointed if we came runners up in the league. Um, you were disappointed if somehow we weren't challenging in those days in the European Cup, European Cup Winners' Cup, the UEFA Cup. Um, you know, we were and are European royalty. So it was just felt like every season, not only did we have these challenges, you know, domestically with the FA Cup and, and, and the, the league, of course, but also we were always traveling to exotic places on Wednesday nights and Tuesday nights and whatever it happened to be. And that's just who Liverpool were. I think, you know, from the the mid nineties on, um, you know, the, the, the kind of wheels fell off a little bit and, and we lost our way. And um, what happened, I think then is that the, the club had commercially lost its way a little bit as football changed, as the Premier League became this financial behemoth, as transfer fees went from, I remember the first hundred thousand pound player thinking there's no way, there is no way, Alan Ball for Everton, there's no way anybody can, you know, spend more money than that on a footballer. Um, and, um, and here we are, we're, you know, the Neymars of this world for going for 200, 230 million. So football changed dynamically. I think clubs bluntly, like Manchester United, um, uh, you know, got ahead in the commercial business that allowed them to uh, afford more players and better players than other clubs. Um, Liverpool now have certainly caught up on that. And, and it is so heartening to see um, you know, a generation, you know, I have a nephew who's 31 who had no recollection of Liverpool winning the league, which is bizarre to mm. me. Um, you know, I remember all 18 league titles prior to this one. Um, and, um, you know, to be able, and, and one of the great memories I'll take um, is being on the bus when we took the European Cup, the Champions League trophy through the streets of Liverpool. You remember that day, Steve. I mean, it's mm. just something that was absolutely stunning. Three quarters of a million people on the streets. For me, looking down, at the faces of those people as we drove through Kensington and Tobruk and Islington, um, they, they really don't have a lot to be thankful for. They don't have an affinity to anything bigger than their own lives, which can be challenging at times. What they do have is Liverpool Football Club. And so when, when Liverpool win, they win. Um, and this period we've had of, of really not winning anything um, it's been tough on those people. And so that outpouring of just pure joy and passion that you saw um, was absolutely incredible. And that, 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 again, is a moment that I'll never forget, being on the bus with the players, looking down at the sheer joy, grown men in absolute tears of this 30, 40 seconds they'd waited four hours on the side of the streets for, of the team bringing the European Cup and showing it to them. It was a phenomenal time. So, yeah. You know, the, the three year period I was there, champions of everything and everywhere. And so, you know, on the pitch, um, couldn't have been asked for a, a better period in Liverpool's history. Such a momentous time. We're, we'll move on to this from Joanne Nicholl, who says, what's the best Liverpool match you have been at? As Peter just diverts yeah, away am, to his, his 3 p.m. Totally. position. <laughs> Let me get you this come, right. You, let me get this. There we right. go. That's that's a bit better. If you get yourself it'll, in the shade focus, there. Yeah. If I lean over to the right like this. As long as you're comfortable, come Peter. Look. <laughs> <laughs> no, Imagine I'll, I'll you're leaning this. on a defender. No, um, yeah, exactly. Well, I've done that many times. Um, yeah, do you want to say it's the best I, Liverpool match? But we were talking before we came on to this about the Barcelona away game, which perhaps might go down in the other categories as the worst ever. But I think it's a great conversation to talk about how empowering sport can be and how unity within a team or a club can achieve almost the impossible. Yeah, I mean, the, people remember, you know, the game at Anfield. For me, the Barcelona game was spread over 
eight, nine days because we went to Barcelona and, and in my role, um, you know, you sit next to the opposing chairman in, in this particular instance, Jose Maria Bartomeu, uh, the, the president of Barcelona, a, a, an absolute gentleman who I still stay in touch with, even though he's no longer rather controversially involved with, with Barcelona. Um, and so the protocol, what happens is that, you know, it's, it can get a little awkward, right? You're sat right next to them. He's jumping up when they score. I'm jumping up when we, I mean, <laughs> and so there, you almost apologize to each other in this. In this particular instance, he, he you know, if, if you recall that game away at Barcelona, we actually were the better team by far. And he, um, a, a great football aficionado, kept leaning over and said, you're killing us. You're killing us. And then I think Suarez scored the first goal and he apologized. He said, we have no business being ahead. And then when the Messi free kick went in and the final whistle mm -hmm. went, he said, I, I don't know how we were able to win 3-0 with a performance like that. So then fast forward to, re, you know, the return leg at Anfield. And what happens on a Champions League day is it is my job to host the visiting executives. And so what we typically do uh, is in the last couple of years, we've taken them to the art school, which is, if you live in Liverpool, know is a superb restaurant um, in the Georgian Quarter, Paul Askew, um, chef. And we have a private room and we have typically a lunch in which this protocol, the UEFA, delegates are there, I present, so blah, blah, blah. But Bartomeu, Bato, uh, as he likes to be called, was constantly telling me I'm worried about tonight. And I thought he was just winding me up because look, uh, we all know what happened, it's great now, but we were down three nil, which meant if Barcelona could, Barcelona could score one goal, then we had to score five. And, um, you know, we all know how it ended, but I will say, he said, no, I'm worried. The way you played, I worry about us. And you might recall Roma had turned them over the previous year with a similar lead. And I think that was sticking in his mind. So that wonderful night at Anfield, um, when, when the final whistle went, and this is the quality of, of people, despite the crushing disappointment and embarrassment, because I think ultimately it cost him his job as president. Um, he come, came over, you know where I sit in the director's box, and, and, and he would be sitting uh, across the aisle, um, maybe four feet away, hugged me, this is pre-COVID, and um, said, now go on and win it, because you deserve it. And, and let me tell you, there are a lot of executives that don't do that, that, that um, a number in particular just storm off uh, and don't even shake hands once Liverpool inevitably had beaten them. But that Barcelona period um, will stick with me for the rest of my life. And when you think about the odds, remember, no Mo, um, Andy Robertson off in the second half, um, Bobby, you know, all of this, you think about, you know, it's Divock. It's basically Divock and Genie um, against arguably at that time, the best team in the world um, and conquering um, Messi, Suarez, Coutinho, you name them uh, that night. Um, was unbelievable. And it was one of those nights where, as my wife will attest, once I get home, the, even though I'm not out there kicking the ball, the adrenaline is running. And I remember getting home probably midnight and then having to watch the entire game again on television till about 3 a.m. Just so, A, I could, I could soak it all in, understand it better, and then let my adrenaline drop down again so that I could actually go to sleep. What an incredible night that was. But the power of the collective, as you know, detailed by Bill Shankly 50 years earlier, was still, for the men in red, was still flowing through, regardless who was wearing those shirts. They were Liverpool players. Absolutely. And perhaps the challenge for the manager as well, Beth uh, Fowley puts here, how would you describe the journey from losing a Champions League final to winning one? So actually, if you think about how Jurgen Klopp was dealing with that and, and some of the players in the side as well, that's a remarkable thing to do, isn't it? To get so close to fall, but actually yeah. get back up again. Well, I think, you know, you look at Kiev, obviously 3-1 to, to Real Madrid. Again, a game that I thought we've done enough to be very competitive in, you know, obviously, and, you know, well-documented mistakes that were made. Um, it was nil-nil and, you know, the the second half seemed to have just kicked off and mm. all of a sudden, you know, the ball's in the back of the net from a, a mistake and, and Benzema 
you know, jumped on it to his credit. Sadio equalizes, but then, you know, Gareth Bale's overhead kick is one where mm-hmm. bizarrely, I, I remember myself applauding, which is a little weird uh, because it was crushing for us at Liverpool because I thought that's it. But it is also one of the better goals I've seen live, to be blunt. Um, and then the third goal was a, was a swerving shot again by Bale. But, but I will say this. I remember the team having the resolve flying back the next morning from, from Kiev. Um, the team had the resolve. Um, it, nobody was down because I think they all understood. And I assume Jürgen had um, instilled this in at the final whistle is that this was a learning experience. Next year, we will use this and we will go all the way as a result of this. So, and, and you know, as you recall, a uh, couple of changes, goalkeeper, um, you know, bringing in, um, uh, you know, key defenders and what have you, just a few little nips and tucks changes, uh, but the core team was pr- still pretty much the same. Um, you remember that Mo had to go off in the final after a tackle mm. from Sergio Ramos. Mm. So, um, you know, all of this was, 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 you know, psychologically crushing, but, you know, what doesn't kill us makes you stronger. And I think that that, that edict was taken um, into the following season where we pretty much steamrolled anybody in our way, um, you know, Barcelona included, Bayern Munich, if you recall, you know, going, that for me, interestingly, was, was one of the bigger games was, you know, nil-nil at Bayern. And I do remember, um, again, a, a lesson here in, in experience, the Bayern Munich executives jumping up and down at the final whistle because they thought nil-nil at Anfield was their ticket to the next round. But Karl-Heinz Rummenigge remembers the last time he was playing, it was nil-nil at Anfield and got beat uh, in, in, in Munich. He remembered that. And, and again, an absolute gentleman said, boy, this is far from over. And he said, I wish we'd have got a goal because an away goal, as you know, is, is, is vital. Um, and we went to, to Munich and, and in a pretty, when I say hostile, unbelievable environment there, um, you know, easily beat them with, with the stunning goal from Sadio Mane. In fact, two goals from Sadio. Um, if you recall, uh, with, with the pass from Virgil and spinning Man- Manuel Neuer backwards. Um, that was an incredible night as well. And again, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge and Uli Hoeneß, two German legends of the game, came straight to me and said, congratulations, go ahead and win this. And I was so happy for them the following year uh, that they won. Uh, again, you, mm. they, they had got beaten by us, embarrassed by us, but they took that and Hansi Glick, produced a you know a stunning performance against Barcelona you recall and of course beating PSG in the final so these things about losing is tough but but it's horrific if you don't take anything from it both ourselves and then followed by Bayern Munich took hard defeats and then uh, turned them into uh, unbelievable victories the following year a great example of the respect shown uh, amongst top clubs as, as Absolutely. well Quite a few questions about transfers. And obviously you, you refer to a period where big transfers were made. Um, yeah. Some of the people on here saying, what role do you play in a transfer? How difficult is it to work in the market now? There's a specific question here talking about Virgil van Dijk and how tough that was to get over the line. And, and maybe this one here in terms of the biggest transfers, are they really tough to achieve? So, I think I made it very clear during my tenure there, and you know this, I had nothing to do directly with the transfer business. Uh, my job was to make sure the money was there, uh, if you will, uh, to afford the players. <laughs> the, way, uh, the way Liverpool was and are structured and the way modern football clubs now structure is that you have the manager and the sporting director, the scouting staff, the sports science and analytics staff all work together identifying needs uh, from what the manager thinks he needs uh, in a particular season or the season ahead. Um, and the, the work in transfers is done primarily by the sporting director who will um, work with the manager, sit down, say, here's a player we think is available for this price. Uh, ownership, of course, has to approve as well. But my direct involvement in the transfer business was, was pretty close to zero. I was obviously aware of what was going on. We needed to make sure that financially we were in a position to be able to afford a player and to manage not only incoming players, but also to 
to manage out players that were better served playing somewhere else and getting maximum value for them. Um, but, you know, COVID has changed a lot of things. Um, it's very clear, you know, that, that a lot of football clubs uh, have to ratchet back. Does that change, I think, the overall value proposition in the market? Probably down the line as you're seeing football clubs announce their financial statements now and you can see how much challenge uh, COVID has presented, no match day income, um, having to take a hit on media rights. But the transfer business, I believed and learned very quickly, um, and it was made very clear to me when I came into the role, my job was the business of football, not, not the business of footballers, if you will. And um, we left it to the absolute professionals. The challenge that I could see coming from a corporate background is that if your CEO is involved day to day in the transfer business, uh, everything else tends to you fall through the cracks at times, unless you've got a massive organization underneath. And so I think more and more, you're going to see the role of sporting director become a very prolific role in modern football clubs. Already is, um, certainly outside of England. There's a legacy of, of, of the CEO wanting to get involved in the negotiations, but you talk to most of the uh, big European clubs and, and they have a specialty group uh, headed by a sporting director that manages the transfer business. You've talked about your remit, remit being the financial one within the club. I suppose the financial pressures now, and you've mentioned it there on, on clubs worldwide, are huge because of COVID. What are the pressures that a club like Liverpool faces? I think it's pretty well documented that it's probably lost something like 100, 125 million pounds up to this point. Yeah, I mean, the loss of match day income. Look, remember, you, you know, Liverpool invested enormously in a brand new new main stand, A, to increase the attendance capacity, but also B, to uh, drive revenue. You, it allowed um, the club to build better quality corporate hospitality to, to, quite frankly, get in line where a lot of other clubs had already gone. That drives revenue. Football is a classic virtuous cycle. You, you, you drive revenue, you, you take that revenue, you buy better players. Better players give you better results. Better results and victories and trophies attract better sponsors who drive revenue and write bigger checks. And, and that goes in this classic virtuous cycle. All of a sudden, if that cycle is broken because the revenue is not there, then everything else has to be adjusted. But yeah, I mean, the match day income losses of, of, of Liverpool ultimately, depending when we ever get back, will be well in excess of 100 million pounds. And that's got to be, you know, that's real money that it's got to be um, assessed and found somewhere else. Um, the, the ability to negotiate with the media companies was key. And um, I think all of us wish fans were there, but at least we're watching football. And, you know, you turn up the EA Sports soundtrack and, you know, it maybe sounds like there's a, the, a, there's a crowd there. Having attended, um, I think, eight games behind closed doors in, in my previous role, it is the most bizarre experience. It's like sitting at an empty stadium, there's maybe 20 people there. And I don't know whether you've had the chance to do it, Steve, in your reporting capacity, but it's like, yeah. it's like being at Sefton Park and watching, you know, throw, just throw a couple of jumpers down either end and, and you hear every word. And, and, and what certainly, um, for me, it shows who the leaders are, because you can hear everything, everything out there. And for me, um, there was only two players. It was Virgil van Dijk, whose booming baritone uh, would emanate across all of the stadiums, and Jordan Henderson, who does not have a booming baritone, but his Mac accent, uh, he just never shuts up. And uh, it's almost like he's, you know, Martin Tyler, he's commentating on the game. Uh, and you, you must have experienced this if you've been at Anfield and, and this, you can hear everything. Um, some of it you don't want to hear, but bluntly you can, you can hear um, who the leaders are. I, I had a similar experience. I actually sat next to um, James Milner for a game and he has got a similar uh, mouthpiece on him. Never yeah. stops. Clear yeah. management material. Absolutely, yeah. They're, they're out there, aren't they? Um, yeah. let, the club's in great hands, isn't it? You, you can't say that about all football clubs, but I think for, for Liverpool fans and, and given perhaps what they experienced with American owners over 10 years ago, this ownership group is in a really good place and the right partner. Absolutely. I mean, the benefit that, that you have with Fenway Sports Group is this is not their first rodeo, as we say here in the States, that they have uh, a, a similar situation with the Boston Red Sox. Um, you know, Boston Red Sox, huge club, uh, great stadium, uh, historic stadium in Fenway Park. 
um, but had underperformed, unlike Liverpool, who had underperformed for maybe 20 odd years, 86 years since the Boston Red Sox had won the World Series. Um, and they took, but still selling out every game. There's this aura, as there is of Liverpool, that regardless of the result, you want to be there. You want to be in Fenway Park. And I, I was lucky enough in the 90s working for Reebok and being based in Boston to spend a lot of time learning baseball deeply, understanding what baseball meant to American culture and society, and laughing at the Boston Red Sox who would find the most incredible ways of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory on, on a regular occasion. But Fenway Sports Group came in, acquired the club, I believe in 2001, and by 2004 had won uh, the World Series. And I was living in Boston at the time and, and remember it very, very well. Um, and um, so they knew what it took to build not only a championship team, but a championship structure underneath that team uh, in the form of what they call in, in baseball back office staff. Um, they rejected uh, any plea to knock down Fenway Park and go build a new stadium to compete with the New York Yan Yankees in the same way that they rejected a, a, a lot of plans that were already in place to knock down Anfield and build a new stadium on Stanley Park. And um, I think we all agree it was the right decision. Obviously, instead of knocking it down, as we discussed, they built the new main stand. Plans are well underway now for the expansion of Anfield Road. The stadium then will be at 61,000. You'll still have the cop. You'll still be in the same place that um, uh, the club played its first game. And we all remember that Everton originally played there. Um, mm. So from the perspective of maintaining the history of the club, it was the right decision to make. But th that ownership group, to your point, Steve, understands patient capital, investing in the right people, um, being patient. Uh, Jürgen's first you know, 50 games were not setting the world on fire, but they knew they had the right man. They didn't... Uh, you know, knee jerk uh, towards another manager, which a lot of clubs have done if, if nothing is happening after the first six mm -hmm. months. Uh, they, they had a long term plan for success. And obviously, um, you know, that has turned into beyond our wildest dreams to be FIFA World Club Cup, uh, European champions and Premier League champions, Super Cup as well, you know, all within the same 15 month period. You must be very proud of all that. Do you watch it like a fan now on on yeah. Sunday? You'll get up there at 8 a.m. Are you watching it, you know, with Let those fan you, nerves? I will not sleep Saturday night because I know I need to get it. I mean, it's actually a late game, 8.30 a.m. The the 12.30 a.m. <laughs> there, p.m.s, are, I get up at 4 o'clock here. I'll put my shirt on like anybody else. Um, pair of shorts, depending on the time of day, cup of coffee. Um, if it's a little later, there might be a beer involved, but uh, yeah, I'm absolutely a fan. It's, um, I think it's easier for me to watch it when behind closed doors, once it's full again, it's going to be harder for me because, uh, you know, I, when I was there three years there, I realized I attended 160 games and, and obviously mm -hmm. never missed a game, um, in my entire time, well, well preseason tours, postseason tours every League Cup game, every FA Cup game, and of course, every Premier League and Champions League game. Um, and um, since I left, we've not had crowds back. The, the day that that's got 54,000, and again, I think it'll be a tough day for me because I'll know Billy Hogan sat in my seat. So uh, <laughs> no, uh, it will be difficult. But yeah, I'm a fan. I'm screaming at them. My son, uh, who lives in Los Angeles, will have uh, a text thread going analyzing every kick, um, you know, one of the things and advice for all of you is to get your children to support the same team that you do so that uh, when you get to my age that they can live and die with you, with your team. Um, and, um, you know, he's an American, lives in Los Angeles, eats, drinks, sleeps Liverpool Football Club. I've had him over to Anfield several times. So, you know, we have that back and two of, yes, Sadio lad, uh, or can't believe what just happened type thing so yeah and I could never do that watching the game in my club suit and tie and trying to be uh, courteous the one thing that I do enjoy is when we score I can jump up and scream now um, that's not done in the director's box uh, you know you would jump no. up and politely clap like this but that's that's about as much as you're allowed to do enjoy it as much as you can your, your other club is Wrexham and Callan says is there truth or what can you tell us about the relationship with uh, two very famous people in Hollywood, Ryan Reynolds and Rob uh, McElhaney. 
yeah. who are on the verge of buying the club. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Um, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, I got to meet Rob. He actually, where I'm sat, and Rob was right there um, about four weeks ago. He drove up from uh, his home in Beverly Hills, as you do, <coughs> and um, sat down with me and explained why he and Ryan Reynolds wanted to buy Wrexham Football Club. And just as background, um, you know, when my dad, um, we left Liverpool to get a pub in, just between Wrexham and Chester, which my family still lives there in a little village called Marford. And, my dad got the red line top of the hill in, in Marford, and I ended up um, living in Wrexham throughout my teenage years, playing for Wrexham schoolboys. Joey Jones was left back. I was right back. It was a fearsome twosome right there. You never came down the wings. The two of us there and, and playing actually for North Wales schoolboys with Joey and Mickey Thomas. And so I was very involved. And, and if I wasn't at Liverpool or I wasn't playing, I played in the Welsh National League for the best part of a decade. Um, then I would go watch Wrexham the race course ground and in those days they they made the second division what is now the championship you'd get 15 to 20,000 at the race course they were giant killers beat Arsenal famously um, and and would play in the European Cup Winners Cup because they'd win the Welsh Cup and you know you'd home to Peterborough then away to FC Porto on, on a Wednesday night and uh, they were great days so Rob and Ryan um, acquired the club because they wanted to do something for a community Long story, give you the 30 second version. Rob, during lockdown, Rob's famous for Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <coughs> and more recently, a great show on Apple TV called Mythic Quest, in which he plays a, a video game creator. So my worlds collide there. Um, he had watched Sunderland Till I Die. And he said, from the opening, and, and I'm sure you've watched it, Steve. You know, mm. It's a phenomenal documentary. From the opening credits of that haunting song, he said, I know these people. This is Philadelphia. I don't know where Sunderland is, but this is Philadelphia. Mm. The Philadelphia Eagles, if you follow the NFL, are as crap as Sunderland have been over the past few years <laughs> to the absolute dismay of the community. And, and we all know what a huge football club Sunderland is. We all know, and if you wa haven't watched the documentary and if it's available where you live, even if you don't like football, it, it tells you something about the human spirit and what sports, and in this case, football can do to lift the spirits of a community that has been downtrodden and, and forgotten. And Philadelphia was in the same place. He, he grew up in South Philadelphia and he said, he called his mate Ryan Reynolds, again, as you do, and uh, said, we've got to go do something because I think with the amount of money we have, we're not using it well. And let's go find a football club, a soccer club that, um, that we can help and help the community. And Rob and I chatted for hours and he, um, brilliant guy, great actor, but, but a great writer. Um, and Ryan was just coming off um, Deadpool 2, I think, and getting ready for Deadpool 3, which I think is on the cards. But, but again, speaking with both of them, their hearts are absolutely in the right place. They're, they're, they're as funny as hell as regards guys to interact with. But they want to do good and they realize the power of sport to do good and they also realize that they can do something for a community they've never been to they've never visited but they've researched and they know everything about it so everyone was saying to them you should go find peter moore because he grew up in wrexham after leaving liverpool he played there um for the, for the schoolboy teams he played at the race course which i did now he's there in america and blah 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 so um, it's a volunteer for me. I spent a lot of time doing it, helping them pick through what football is all about. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things, again, I'm giving back to a place that um, has had a really tough last 10 years in Wrexham and North Wales uh, as industries have evolved and they haven't been able to take advantage of new um, industries that have uh, grown up elsewhere and have taken labor away. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And I think we're pretty close to completion of the um, acquisition of the club were days away from the supporters trust the club went bankrupt basically in 2008 and since then it's been um supported by a Wrexham st Wrexham supporters trust so basically a fan-owned club to keep them alive so i'm happy to be able to do that to help again um a football club that gave me a lot of joy in the 70s in particular oh we still got you now haven't we it's such yeah. a surreal story but at the same time wonderful that you're involved and there's lovely undertones to it 
Look, we could go on forever about the gaming market, and we've spoken about this before, so you're going to have to be more concise because I realise time's pressing for you. Uh, Scott says, how easy was the transition from EA Sports uh, to becoming CEO of Liverpool? But perhaps talk about the, the two sports, and gaming is a sport, isn't it? And you were there at the beginning, and yep. now it's a multi-billion dollar sport. You know, you're, everybody on the call, you'll have these moments in your life where you have to make a decision about a job. You have to make a decision about sometimes moving for a job. And sometimes you have to make a decision about, you know, leaving an industry, if you will, that you've been in that you feel very comfortable with and stepping off the precipice and doing something that you bluntly have no idea about. And I did that uh, for, for 20 years. When I arrived here in America in 1980, I, I worked in sporting goods. I was for 11 years work for Patrick. Those of you of a certain age will remember Patrick Boots. And um, I started off right here in Southern California as a commission only salesman selling boots up and down the California coast. Um, and that told me a lot about selling. I had no sales background, but I was a scouser. So I could figure out how to get people to do things that they maybe didn't want to do, which was buy my shoes. The good news was as many of you, if you play football, remember Patrick's were great shoes. Kevin Keegan. Them. <laughs> I, um, I was selling Keegan Golds and Michelle Platini Golds um, even then for $125 a pair. And Patrick's were pretty ubiquitous in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, and then I got recruited to go to live in Boston to do the same thing for Reebok, who were not in the global soccer business. And I built that from scratch. Went and got a young kid called uh, Ryan Giggs to wear Reeboks when he was 17. And that's all he ever wore and may still be wearing Reeboks as far as I know. Dennis Bergkamp, Andy Cole, um, and just built factories in Italy and, and was able to put Reebok into the global soccer business. I then, my career evolved at Reebok and ended up in, uh, in 98 being uh, global um, senior vice president of global marketing for the brand, taking the Reebok brand around the world. But Reebok, these were the days, and, and you, you're all too young to remember when Reebok and Nike were head to head. These were the sneaker wars, and um, but Nike had stolen, uh, you know, um, a, a real march on Reebok in the '90s, and I realized that I needed to be open to a career change. So again, as we let off this call, the executive recruiter, the headhunter, calls and says, uh, "Hey, uh, what do you know about video games?" And I said, "Nothing, other than I just bought my son a Sega Saturn, um, and they don't make games for it anymore, so I'm a little annoyed." Uh, he said, well, it's funny you mentioned that Sega is looking for a senior vice president of marketing. And um, would you be open to interviewing? It's back in San Francisco. Um, and I said, look, I know nothing about the industry. Uh, uh, but he said, this one thing that's interesting, this will be the first console that will go online, that will connect mm -hmm. to the internet. And that piqued my interest a little because I realized that should gaming become social and ubiquitous, then it had a chance to be more than what I used to say then, boys in their bedrooms, you know, Donkey Kong and Nintendo. Um, I took a chance. I, I said, yes, I'm leaving Reebok. Um, I'm going to move back to San Francisco. Um, and uh, within 90 days, I was promoted to president and chief operating officer of Sega of America. We were launching the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast had a dial-up modem that allowed you, somehow we figured out how to uh, make games play through dial-up, which was great unless your mum picked up the phone in the other room and then your game was disconnected <laughs> as a result. But, but we launched the Dreamcast. It, you know, in the end, we couldn't quite get the Dreamcast to where it needed to be. Sega had to get out of the hardware business. But I then caught the attention of, of Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates at, at, at Xbox, who I'd started to work with, obviously up in Microsoft, and uh, got a call again from an executive recruiter that hey, you know, I'm an intermediary between you and, and, and Microsoft. They'd like to you to consider coming up and living in Seattle because they're launching a new platform yet to be named that will be the successor to the original Xbox. And they've seen what I've done with the Dreamcast. So, yeah, again, took another chance, left San Francisco, um, hauled the family to Seattle and had five wonderful years working for Microsoft as head of Xbox and launched the Xbox 360. And um, that was a little bit more sophisticated. Actually had broadband so you could actually uh, play games uh, on a broadband connection. But we also built Xbox Live, which was where, the, the, where, where social gaming that is now a $160 billion industry really started to take off. And then again, executive recruiter one more time um, said, 
pings me and says, time to come home. I always remember, always remember the email. And I clicked on the email as a recruiter that had taken me to Seattle and said, EA is building out a label structure and they're looking for a president of EA Sports. So I looked at that and thought, this is my two worlds colliding sports and, and video games. I love the idea of once again, getting back to the San Francisco Bay Area and joined EA in July of 2007 and had 10 wonderful years there. First of all, as president of EA Sports and then for the last four years, uh, five years being chief operating officer of EA. And then the executive recruiter calls and it's Liverpool and there's, <laughs> well, there's my life. Yes, we can see how big it is. And there's a question here from Bainbridge Island FC, which says, uh, "Oh yeah, can, right Peter in Seattle. Give, can Peter give some examples of good bad decisions he's made on his career pathway?" Well, you've just mentioned a bit about your your career pathway, um, but it, advice on a pathway within professional sport is there one thing perhaps you, you'd say to people? Yeah, I think you know, um, for me, within sports, sports was a different industry, and so I, I was very used to. Look, I, I found it frustrating the first few months at Liverpool Football Club because nobody was moving as fast as I was used to in Silicon Valley and video games. And I realized that I had to figure out how to integrate myself into an industry that had different metrics, different ways of operating, uh, different uh, speed of action, mm. if you will. None of it, which was wrong, but it was very different. And I think... Um, I think the key for me was to learn to understand uh, that, it, that I wasn't always right and, and uh, that uh, this was a tried, true, and tested process within the football industry of getting things right, maybe spending a little bit more time on getting them right than I was used to. Um, our, our in, certainly in games and in technology, we would have this mantra of fail fast, fail cheap. Uh, and so the idea was throw a lot of ideas at the wall prototype a lot of things, try different stuff. Great, spend some money on it, but if it didn't work, cut it, you know, don't continue to throw good money after bad. And, um, you know, that I tried that at Liverpool and nobody was about, nobody wanted to fail, period. So there was a little bit more of a conservative attitude towards failure. In the industries, as you go back in, and I'll, I'll be tripping my way back into video games, it's still very much keep trying, fail, 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 but fail quickly and fail cheaply, but try, try, try. So um, yeah, and then we can talk and Bainbridge Island is just outside of Seattle. We can talk uh, about the Red Rings of Death, which anybody that owned an Xbox 360 will remember. And that was one of the more jarring periods of my life where I realized that we had created a multi-billion dollar problem with the hardware uh, that eventually we came to grips with and spent over a billion dollars fixing the problem. If we hadn't wow. have done that, and I'm talking back in 2007, the Xbox brand wouldn't exist anymore and, and Microsoft wouldn't be in video games. Um, but that's a whole episode on its own, talking about the Red Rings of Death. I'm just going to finish this off. You've been so kind with the time you, you've spared us. What, what do you feel most blessed about within that professional journey as you look back now? For me, I think... When I think about sports and I think about video games and, and sports again in, in, in Liverpool, to be witness to giving joy to so many people, not because I was able to do it directly, but to be involved in organizations, particularly sports and then games themselves and to be witness to the growth of games and ubiquity of gaming. Um, I've been involved, I've been so blessed to be involved in industries that, that make people smile. Um, and yeah, look, you lose games, you get frustrated. You, you, you lose a video game, you throw your controller at the wall. It's not all smiles, but for the great part, I've been involved in consumer industries that really bring brightness to people's lives. And, uh, you know, right now you think about what we're going through with COVID, sports and video games are absolutely ubiquitous right now as the, the way that we are finding releases from this miserable world we're living in that just feels weird to all of us. Um, and yeah, I can only think, you know, for me, it's, it's everybody's playing FIFA and, and watching Liverpool on Sunday, you know? So <laughs> there's my two worlds. Uh, Peter, you've been an absolute gen. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all the questions. There's so many people on the call and so many questions in there, but you've answered a wide variety of them and we wish you all the best in, 
in Santa Barbara and when you come back to Wrexham and Liverpool in the future. So great yeah, to catch yeah. up. Thank you, Peter. It'll be, a, it'll be a great day when I can come back to Anfield and there's 54,000 there. It'll be a great day when we can sing You'll Never Walk Alone again, you know, particularly with the passing of Jerry Marsden and, and bringing us all back together again. So uh, you bet I'll be on a plane heading to uh, Liverpool to be able to enjoy that. And thanks for everybody for listening and put up to me. There's, there's a whole lot of stories underneath all of this. It feels like we should do this again. So, but it's been, it's been a blast. I appreciate it. And thank you for all the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them. Uh, Peter, absolutely brilliant. On behalf of the whole LLS team and the Stephen Gerrard Academy, Peter Moore, our special guest today, and some fantastic stories live from Santa Barbara. Um, would you believe it? Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on another Extra Time.